Ladies and gentlemen, we are on the air with tonight's Ring of Honor Final Battle Recap Show. I am Mike Poulin, your host, along with Rowan. Hey, Mike, how's it going? It is going good. Good, good. Nice to be working with you for the first time. First of hopefully many times, if ROH keeps up these pay-per-views. I'm going to go on the record and say that I don't order a whole lot of pay-per-views in general. In fact, I don't mind saying I'm one of those people that, you know, uh, torrents everything. But uh, for some reason, I had it in me that this was the one that I was going to go to the pocket to. And as soon as I made that decision, it turned out I got off to a bad start because I turn on the pay-per-view and I get to the screen where it says, uh, you know, uh, this is, you know, warning, copyrights, all this stuff. And it sits on that screen for, you know, close to about 10 to 12 minutes. And I'm, my, my son's trying to figure out what's going on. And we start changing the channel. And turns out I had only ordered the pre-show and not the pay-per-view. So oh, that I- <laughs> happens to me quite a bit. So I actually missed about the first 10 minutes of the show. You missed probably some of the four-way then. I got through about half of the first match there. So from what I saw, this was basically the Hanson show, this first match. Yeah, it seems like they have plans for him. The opening match was a four-way between Hanson and... Uh, Jimmy Jacobs, there? Mark Briscoe, and uh, Caprice Coleman. Yeah, so basically it was the Hanson show plus we need three other dudes. So we have spots for four guys on this card. Yeah, so the the, the part where I caught it, in was uh, Hanson had Jacobs uh, in body slam position on the floor, and Briscoe hits him with a running blockbuster from the apron. Yeah, I, that was that was a nice spot there. Basically, this was you know as you said a showcase for Hanson to get him on the show because right now his partner's currently out, and Hanson gets the win by pinning Caprice with a, uh, ki- a spin kick. Yeah, uh, the whole match probably only went maybe, I don't know, seven or eight minutes, and yeah. of that, Hanson was on offense most of the time, and there were a couple of spots in between the three other guys, but none of it really much mattered. So, like you said, Hanson gets a strong push in the opener. After that, we are given a video package of Adam Page and Roderick Strong, a battle the, of the uh, decade. big, yeah, belt matches here. Now, now here's my thing with the decade, because I haven't really liked this story since I got back into watching the TV back in May. But Tadarius Thomas, who was also in the group, left a few months ago after a match with Adam Page. Roderick Strong, who was originally in the group, had a tag match with him, BJ, and Adam Page against uh, Caprice Coleman, Tadarius, and Will Ferreira, who's one of the students. Mm-hmm. The whole thing was Paige basically tried to give Roderick Strong a chair, and Strong refused to use it. And then Paige then accidentally clotheslined Strong during the match. Now, one thing I noticed, because they played this video package about three or four times during the countdown show, is that when Paige cut his promo on TV a couple weeks ago, he seemed very nervous. Now, I don't know how often you actually get to watch the TV, Rowan, but can you comment on that or no? I haven't been catching up with the TV in the last little while. In fact, this was only when I was uh, previewing this card that I realized that there's two members of the decade going against each other. And I thought, well, how would, how is this story going to play out? And then after seeing the opening video package, my first thought was that these roles are completely reversed. Uh, I, I think Paige should have been cast as the baby face, breaking away from the from the evil yeah, heel legend. Yeah, that's what I kind of botched the uh, storyline here. Because they started um, it off well with Tadarius wanting to break away, but then Paige kind of stayed in the group, and Roderick broke away, and then they were trying to set up Roderick and BJ, and then BJ kind of said, no, you're going to face Adam Page instead. And uh, I think the ending of this match pretty much reinforced my opinion that these two were, were kind of cast in, in opposite roles. So let's kind of go through this match here. Paige comes out looking exactly like a very young Brian Pillman with yeah. the the, uh, the four horsemen leather vest. They go back and Which forth with a couple. Which BJ gave to him in a segment on the uh, video wire like a few that I saw a few days before the show. So See, it would have been nice if they had made that known to us who haven't seen that, you know, with a, just a nice little touch. Well, that's so. something ROH I think needs to work on is actually establishing these newer characters that we don't see much of because of as we'll get into in a later match because they're only on TV maybe once or twice a month at best. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. So uh, the action starts really aggressively. Roddy uh, kind of chops him to the ground like a government mule, wails him into the guardrail, flips him over the guardrail, and Paige just kills Roddy with a clothesline, throws him back in the ring. Brutal. Paige then hits, uh, I guess he had him set up for the Orton <laughs> second rope DDT, turns it into a swing, a second rope swinging, draping neckbreaker for a two. Uh, I thought that was yep. a cool move. Yep. Roddy hits this beautiful dropkick right on target. Hard close Roddy has off. some of the best dropkick I've seen in quite a while in, in wrestling. He's got some of the best dropkicks since Landstorm, I think. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, he's known for his chops, too. But 
Page kind of looks like he had a front tooth knocked out. His mouth was a little bit bloody, and I, I yeah, they saw pointed that. I think Kevin Kelly pointed that out on commentary, which is another thing. I really like the ROH commentary team. Yeah, the commentary for this show was, of course, uh, Kevin Kelly, Steve Carino, and Nigel and McGuinness, who uh, for the who, first couple of matches. For the first couple of matches, so uh, Roddy hits a, a double knee gut buster for a two, sick kick for a two. Both guys are kind of jockeying for a position on the top rope, and Page gets the advantage with a super swinging neckbreaker from the top. Page then hits another top rope flipping clothesline for a two. And Actually, it was kind- a slingshot one. Right, that was after, though. He hit the, the swinging neckbreaker off the top. Page then hits another top rope flipping clothesline for a two. There's... They're exchanging rights. Roddy hits two big jumping knees, hooks the stronghold, and it, it's at this point where you've got Whitmer and Jacobs on the outside who are just uh, just pleading for him not to tap, don't tap out, totally baby-facing himself. Page refuses to tap. Roddy cinches it in tighter. Page is unconscious, so the ref decide, you know, they do like the uh, the Bret Hart, Steve Austin, WrestleMania stoppage, where both guys look great. Page I think looks- Page is going to be someone that they do something Outside the decade with in 2015, I really see a lot in him. Well, it almost looked like that that they made the decade baby faces by by the end because the decade really puts Page over. Jacobs shakes his hand. Whitmer thought, confronts Steve Carino for some reason. Yeah, now I missed that. Did Carino say something or did Whitmer get on no, the mic? No, Whitmer just went over to him and he's like, "He's on our side now," and just gets in his face for no real reason, especially if it's not going to lead to a match between the two of them. I don't know if Carino has any matches in him, so I guess we'll have to just so. kind of wait wait and see where this I hope leads. Not, he's a great, he's, he actually lends some great credibility to the announce booth in Ring of Honor. So. Mm-hmm. All right, so that takes us to the next match, Michael Elgin and Tommaso Ciampa. Why don't you uh, get us started on this? This match is very an, an awkward situation because it's like with Tommaso, he's got the whole storyline where he's on zero tolerance yeah. policy because he beat up, what's it, Bobby Cruz and some ring around the security guy back in like August – one of the shows, mm-hmm. and Elgin's kind of been in and out of Ring of Honor for like the last four months. Yeah, they didn't really play up a whole lot of Elgin's his his situation outside of the company. No, they didn't. There was more about Tommaso, especially once he uh, closed lines the referee. Yeah, so we we go through the majority of the match. It's it's it, it's not a great match. It's basically a big mean guy battle with lots of power moves. On paper, this match seemed a lot better than it was. Both guys basically hit the running power bomb, both for two counts. The announcers really play up how so few people have ever kicked out of Elgin's finish. Elgin then hits a German to the top turnbuckle. Ciampa then hits a running power bomb for the for a two. Ciampa moves the table in, into a corner and he tries superplexing Elgin from the top rope to the floor, a la two K fourteen. Mm-hmm. Ciampa hits a clothesline on a ref and instantly, without fail, just turns to Nigel, who's at the announce desk, and he's just pleading his innocence. Oh shit. It was an accident. That, Elgin ducked. He thinks that Nigel goes up to leave the booth to go get his termination papers, which I'm sure, storyline-wise, he just happens to have termination papers with him for every event that they go to. <laughs> um, he just kind of leaves them on his desk. Oh, yeah, you know, he's, he's got his little mobile desk every for every show that he goes to, and and uh, the first file he has is, uh, is uh, Ciampa's uh, impending it's termination next, papers. It's, yeah, it's not the next it, title match. It's it makes Ciampa's perfect papers. sense. <laughs> it it kind of reminded, reminded me, you know, like on all those episodes of Raw when William Regal was the commissioner, every time they do a backstage vignette with Regal, he always have his office set up in a different part of each arena. And they did that and, with Foley too, right? And so I like it just makes they want you to think that he just happens to you know carry a picture of the Queen with him everywhere he travels. Wrestling uh, logic, I suppose. <laughs> so basically, the ending comes when Elgin hits uh, a double arm lifting DDT for the win. They don't really go into any further detail about Ciampa's future. Nigel is never seen again on the broadcast, and I guess we got to watch the TV to figure out where this goes. What uh, say you? I mean, it won't be on any of the next TV because that's already been taped. It'll probably be on the TV after that. But have they been like TNAing this and like taping weeks and weeks in advance? Well, I know the last tapings they had were in Baltimore right before Thanksgiving. And that's going to be all the Tag War stuff, which will start airing next week, because they did a preview show for Final Battle this week. Like I said, I I haven't been keeping... three weeks weeks apart from tape to air, usually. Two to three weeks. We get a promo for Ring of Honor's 13th anniversary in Vegas. In uh, Vegas. I guess that will be taped. Uh, Is that done WrestleMania weekend? No, that will be March 1st, and that will be a live show. That takes us to the match that I was most looking forward to. We have uh, Cedric Alexander and The Addiction, consisting of Fallen Angel Christopher Daniels and the man who personally called me a fat turd, 
at a, <laughs> an indie show, Frankie Kazarian <laughs> versus ACH and the Young Bucks, all in Bullet Club gear. This was the first time that I had seen there that I like. Are they official Bullet Club members, or were, are they? Just I know the Bucks out? are, but I don't think ACH is. They just he's just marking it out for the shirt. Right. Yeah. So uh, lots of really smooth tags early in the match between Kaz and Daniels. I should note they're all pimped out in this beautiful bright school bus yellow gear. That being oh God. Uh, that being the addiction and Cedric. Um, turn off I, the lights, they might glow in the dark. I don't want to call them the babyface team because I think all six guys were super over in this match. It seemed like the Bucks and ACH are actually the babyface team. I didn't know which Jackson it was because I still can't tell them apart. Nick uh, is the blonde one and Matt is the one with the darker hair. Okay, so they had the heat on Daniels in the corner, and then it must have been Matt that had done like the double flipping reverse cartwheel into a back rake. Yep. My my son was watching with me. He's fourteen, and he just look, kind of looks at me. It's like, was he supposed to do that? <laughs> That's <laughs> awkward. Uh, yeah. Bucks hit a top rope moonsault backflip combo onto Daniels. Uh, ACH uh, then has a running dive to all the guys on the floor, and you notice he caught his foot on the top rope. He just about ended his own life, I think. He was lucky he was working with such pros that were able to catch him. Now, there was so many, there was like a parade of finishers in this. Uh, I, I couldn't type fast enough. All, all I know is that the over under on super kicks in my household was 56. Huh. Uh, I don't think they hit quite that much, but take us, take us through, uh, the end of this. I know they get rid of Daniels and Katz. They single out Cedric and they each hit like different, like somebody hit a frog splash. I think somebody hit a moonsault and then. ACH hit the 450 to pin Cedric. Yeah, the Bucks set this up with uh, the Meltzer driver. And uh, if you've never seen the Meltzer driver, of course, named after Dave Meltzer, the god among men. And it's not all, uh, basically one of the Bucks has Cedric in tombstone position. The other Buck is on the outside as a springboard front somersault into a spike tombstone. So Dear not only, Lord. Not only is it just a springboard spike tombstone it has to be a flipping springboard spike tombstone thus it has been dubbed the Meltzer driver that wasn't enough uh, ACH had to get his spot in so they hit what they called a 520 but it was clearly a 450 splash for the win uh, like I said I couldn't type fast enough for this I had to go back and watch this match again that's why I was kind of running a little bit late today right go what if Go out of your way, if for no other reason, to see this match. It was fantastic. All six guys were completely over, and this was fantastic. This this was my match of the night. Yep. And we move on to the... The not is, match of the night. Huh, Moose versus Artie Evans, which is basically a callback to when Artie was introduced, because this whole storyline is that Moose cost Artie Evans his streak, and then, thanks to Ramon, or whatever his name is, Stokely... Stokely Whatever. Hathaway. What a name that is, by the way. Artie is the man on an island, because somehow Prince Nana got the both of them. How is Nana still employed in this company 12, 13 years later? I, I don't think they realize he's still there. <laughs> he just <laughs> he, shows up. He just shows up as part of the ring crew, and it's like, oh, my check, didn't, my, my check didn't bounce, so I guess I'll just show up. Where's Jimmy Ray? Uh, he's been gone for a few years, buddy. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you know this. I've mentioned this on previous podcasts. I had a personal stake in this as yeah. R.D. Evans, as I've mentioned before, is actually my homie. He's from my hometown of Winnipeg, Manitoba. They did not mention this on the broadcast. They just billed him as from Manitoba. Was there not enough space in the graphic maker to throw Winnipeg on there? Nope. We have two – well, we've got one regular host on this website – as well as myself and Jordan Garber, both from Winnipeg. It'd be nice if R.O.H. could give us a little bit of love, but not so no, much. No, they give Toronto plenty of love, though. But in any event, this is Nana's way of getting back at R.D. Evans as this match plays out. Veda Scott comes out partway through. Tears yeah. in her eyes, so you can smell the heel turn. Yeah, uh, well, I could smell it right when you see that she didn't come out with R.D. It's like, mm. wait a minute, something's up here. And Nana and Stokely get involved, and that draws the referee. Here comes Veda to try to reason with both of them, and then she low blows R.D. We have a spear, and then we have Moose getting the win, and we pretty much have the groundwork for a new embassy, which they keep going back to every so often. So what do they do with R.D. at this point? Do they... Uh, He's do done. They this is they, basically Nana's revenge because if you remember when they introduced R.D., he was Nana's backer when they first introduced Champa as well because Champa was with Nana. Yeah, he was like, and, like the embassy accountant or something. Or, yeah, the embassy lawyer. Because that's, now, 
During this match, Evans, I don't know if this, if this is part of his gimmick, if he tried to do this, but he botches three slingshot dropkick attempts in a row. Man versus gravity. <laughs> so, anyways, I, th- I think the less said about this one, the better. This was, uh, this was a comedy relief match. Throw away match. Throw it all away. That takes us to the Arrowwich World Television title match between Jay Lethal and Dolph Ziggler Jr., <laughs> Matt Seidel, and his 57 abs. <laughs> and of course, the second I say this, the first thing Carino says is, I'm jealous of Seidel's abs. <laughs> Look at the abs <laughs> on that guy. So, this uh, was okay. Standard fare for lethal. I guess I was kind of expecting more out of these two guys. Yeah. They got about probably, what, 13 minutes of time to go here. That's one thing about this show is other than like Moose Nardi, which was all about four or five minutes, everything went no longer than probably 15 minutes with the exception of the tag title match. And like there was really, there was no filler throughout this show. There were no backstage vignettes. The only real promos they were doing were, was for the anniversary show. Which again, that's something they need to work on with some of these characters that you don't always see on TV, like a Moose or an R.D. Evans or an Adam Page, where they need to have promos that say, hey, it's this guy. And, you know, kind of introduce you to him. Isn't that what what the TV is for, though? Yes, but they don't do that. That's why I'm saying that's <laughs> what they should do. If this were ideal, they would take advantage of their TV time. So, But, yeah, Lethal <laughs> wins after some interference from Martini. There was a great spot halfway through with uh, Karina on commentary. Lethal basically has the heat. He whips Seidel into the ropes, and Truth pulls the rope down, you know, making Seidel basically fly out backwards outside of the ring. And Carino, channeling Bobby the Brain, instantly says, oh, my monitor went out. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, he does compare him and Kevin Kelly to Gorilla and Bobby, so, you know. So someone has been watching his primetime wrestling tapes. <laughs> Some of his old uh, 1991 pay-per-views, maybe. Uh, the crowd starts chanting Twinkies. <laughs> I, I believe, I don't know if that was the truth or at the bodyguard. Jay Diesel, another student. Way to get them all working, on the card. Both guys are kind of working back and forth. Low leg and thigh kicks. Seidel charges into a lethal combination for a two. There's dueling chance for both guys. Then the Randy Savage chant starts. And, yes, uh, uh, lethal hits the uh, big hail to the king. The that elbow. Brutal. Yeah. The ending comes with Truth is running away from Seidel. Seidel is giving chase. Truth tries hitting him with the book. Seidel knocks him down. He goes to the top rope for a shooting star. Now, he had previously hit a shooting star on Lethal for a two count, so he attempts to hit another shooting star on Truth when Lethal catches him in midair, a la Randy Orton from a few years ago. Mm-hmm. He gets all hyped up and then hits an awesome-looking Lethal injection for the win. So, strong win for Lethal, even with the uh, interference. And finally, someone in the House of Truth actually works out so he doesn't break away from them like that's happened the past two years. So I think that sets up. That could probably set up another rematch down the road. Probably, yeah. Depends on what they want to do with Side Allen next year. And we go to the tag title match. Yeah, this is our semi-main event, the team of Red Dragon against the Time Splitters. This Kushido, was good. Kushido comes out wearing his, uh, his traditional Marty McFly vest. <laughs> Every time I see Bobby Fish, I always think he would make a great vaude villain. If he were to ever, you know, sell his soul. Third Vod villain. I took a lot of notes for this. I'm not going to go spot for spot. Basically, about halfway through, Kushida had a cool spot. He hits an O'Connor roll on Fish for a two count. At the same time, O'Reilly goes for a clothesline. He misses, and Kushida grabs him in a waist lock and German suplexes him. So if you can picture it, he's got Fish in an O'Connor roll with O'Reilly in a German suplex for a double pin attempt. So I'd like, I've never seen that before. Mm-hmm. Fish drives Shelly into the barricade. O'Reilly tries a running knee to the outside, but gets super kicked. The super kick counter on this show is now fairly high. I'd, <laughs> with the agents are taking us out having a smoke or something. <laughs> Kushida, he must have a lot of super kicks in every match. <laughs> uh, Kushida, it's like the, the super kick in Ring of Honor is like the uh, the closed fist in WWE. <laughs> Kushida tries a swanton on both guys on the outside. There's a doomsday device drop kick by the splitters for a two count. Talk us through this ending, because I thought this this setup for uh, a finish was really cool between uh, the four guys. Red Dragon hit their finish, which is the uh, kick brain buster, and was it Kushida who kicked out? I think it's, um, okay, so O'Reilly had Kushida in the uh, the cross arm breaker. Yep. There was a top rope assisted slice bread on O'Reilly. That was mm-hmm. broken up by Fish. Kushida then has O'Reilly in position for a moonsault. He goes for a moonsault and dives right into a triangle choke. Which was O'Reilly neat. That looked really cool. Uh, yep. O'Reilly then transitioned that into a cross-arm breaker. And now while in the hold, Fish hits a top rope headbutt to Kushida. 
because she'd have stolen the arm breaker. Shelly then hits a top rope double foot stomp. That was another move that was overused tonight is that double foot stomp. Yep. So he breaks that hole. There's a series of double team moves from both teams. Kushida super kicks O'Reilly's mouthpiece out of his face. That looked deadly. Uh, there's a Pele kick by Kushida, a loop de loop clothesline by O'Reilly for a two. O'Reilly then hits a brain buster. Then they, then they hit the, the chasing the dragon combo, but that only gets a two. They catch Kushida with the cross arm breaker again. He hooks the near leg. So he's, so O'Reilly has both the arm and the near leg in the cross arm breaker. And that is enough to get Kushida to tap out. Yep. And, you know, that's a match is about 18 minutes. Mm-hmm. And it's a very good match, and it's a very good lead into the main. Yeah. I thought this match didn't have as many high-flying moves as the six-man, but I thought that the, that the double-team movers, they looked a lot crisper in this one. Right. And Fish, I'm curious who's next for Fish and O'Reilly. I know they've, t- they've taped the TV and it's all the tag war stuff, but after that, I'm, I'm kind of curious who's next for them. They face the Young Bucks again, or... Either that or they start building up Kaz and Daniels, depending on on how many dates they have. I believe they beat Kaz and Daniels a couple times already, from what I remember. They beat them at Best in the World, and then they beat them at Field of Honor. Uh, do you know how long Roe's going to be out for? Unless they, you know, they start uh, they said up? He, I think they said he's going to be back sometime in 2015, so possibly them. Maybe the Kingdom, if they're done that with could- the poll, after we talk about our next match. That could be, you know, uh, there's a possibility, you know, do they push the decade as, say, like a babyface group? Whitmer and Jacobs against yeah. Red Dragon? Yeah, maybe. I mean, they ain't got enough teams, it's just Red Dragon's kind of gone to them all. That takes us, uh, we're already at our main event. This is a fight without honor. They stress that this is only the third fight without honor in company history. Bullshit. Um, yeah, I found that hard to believe, but I wasn't about ready to go back and, and look at Joe and Loki, Homicide and Carino, uh, freaking Loki and Jay Lethal. There's been a, there's been a bunch of them. They seem to pull it out towards the end of every year, pretty much. Danielson and Morishima is the most recent one I can think of from 08. Right. So Jay comes out looking more and more like Necro Butcher every week. <laughs> um. I don't know about you, but I've never really taken Adam Cole seriously. I mean, he. I he like just... Cole, but he he seems like one of those guys that would be better as a babyface, actually, because of how he looks. Right, like like his basic look. He comes out looking like just a guy. There's really nothing unique about him. He looks like like Joe Indy. Like the moves that he does are good. I think his promos are are above average. But they've got to do something with his look. Either give him, you know, something subtle like long tights or. Cut his hair. Have him a ridge, n- make him some tights or something. Right. But yeah, this this was kind of, it was not what they've been building up, because right off the bat you hear Carino on commentary saying, I don't know why Adam Cole would challenge Jay Briscoe to a fight without honor without the kingdom here, which leads you to believe that someone's going to run in, and you're waiting for that, and it doesn't happen. Either that or they're, or they're starting to tell a story where Cole would come up to them afterwards and say, you know, well, where were you guys? You know, sort of planting that seed. We were, they were in Japan. So Jay hits the Jay Driller very early in this match for a two. Cole bails. Both guys brawl to the floor. Right. Jay clears the announce table. This announce table has been, has been cleaned, uh, what, twice now. <laughs> Cole laid on the table and Jay, like I said, hits the running double foot stomp through the table. Another double foot stomp. I believe that was the fourth foot stomp of the night. So once again, the agents are back, you know, t- taking a smoke break. <laughs> I don't know who will be the agents for Ring of Honor, but, you know. So, uh, Nigel McGuinness is up there drinking them Guinness or something, I guess. Right. Jacob's oh, back look, with another, a... another foot stomp. <laughs> um, hmm, what should we go to? Well, we haven't used a foot stomp or a super kick in ten minutes, so let's go with that. <laughs> you know well, they have a spot early on where Cole goes for the uh, figure four in the ring post a la Bret Hart and gets face slammed into the ring post, cuts him open, or, you know, he's bleeding, and here come, then you have the awkward spot where the freaking uh, medical, the state athletic commission and the oh, medical... God, talk about an impotent medical crew. <laughs> First of all, I love the fact that Cole is underneath the ring for what seems like days, so we know that he's gigging. He comes out, and of course, there's a nice, clean slice right along his hairline, despite the fact that he hit the post at uh, at a perpendicular angle. You know, if we were going to break this down by physics, us, you know, being wrestling nerds and trying to figure this out, Jay then tries to find a table, another table under the ring, but he has to leaf through about 14 tons of bright, colorful streamers. 
So <laughs> I found that kind of funny. <laughs> That's why uh, they hide the streamers after the fans are home. Just right. sweep them out of the ring. No one will find them. Right. And then, you know, you know, if you're looking for your gimmicks under the table, then, you know, we get to see all these nice, pretty streamers again. Somebody's having a birthday party. <laughs> the Young Bucks were on the card. No, that's a super gig party. Yeah. So it's a, it's at about this time where it's about 10 o'clock where I'm at. So, you know, my, my boys got to go to bed, which was good because it was right after this point that the stable gun came out. Oh, that was actually right at the beginning of the match. Yeah, well, like I said, I, I started watching this on the DVR a little bit late, so by the time 10 o'clock rolled around, and I had already started halfway through. So Cole gets a hold of the stable gun, and, start, and there were two chairs set up at ringside, I guess, to go through go with uh, the previous storyline of Cole beating up Papa Briscoe. There's two chairs at ringside, and they, they have signs on them saying, reserved for their Ma and Pa Briscoe. So Cole takes one of these paper signs and staples it, and I, ca- I gotta think, this is a shoot staple. To, uh, a to Briscoe's head. A la New Jack. And it's just hanging off his head like a big piece of skin. And I couldn't take my eyes off it. They go back in the ring, they start doing spots, and this piece of paper is still stuck to Briscoe's head. So Cole gets a couple of chairs, sets him up. Jay turns it around on him, turns it into a falcon arrow on both chairs for a two count. Jay then pulls a kendo stick out from under the ring. Again, he has to rifle through the pretty streamers. And uh, the announcers are still calling it a Singapore cane. And I did I had to do some research. The first time I had heard a Singapore cane was in 1994. And they're still calling it this. Uh, I guess it's the same difference, I guess. So Cole goes to work with the cane on Jay's back. And Jay just starts no-selling it until Jay hit tells me, him to hit, it, hit me in the head. And he does and knocks the hell out of him. Yeah, that's smart. So uh, Cole's working Jay's right leg around the post, and this is the time where Cole starts gigging and they go outside. Now, Jay throws him back into the ring, at which point he slaps on a chin lock. And I'm thinking, if this is no disqualification, it's a fight with an honor, why does he let go of the chin lock? Like, eventually, him out! Eventually, well, yeah, and like he like double throttles him at some point. He just has both hands. Just because the referee told him to, because he's a nice guy. It's at this point where the aforementioned medical staff slash security slash a state athletic commission come out and try to close the wound on Cole's forehead. Jay comes out and attacks medical personnel. What a jerk. So, what a, yeah, he's the baby oh, face here, by the way. Right. And everyone's cheering. Yay, he's attacking trained medical staff. And the medical staff just decide. Wrestling oh, fan logic again. Well, we failed at this. Let's just walk back up the aisle. Also, we have Ring of Honor security, which we all know wrestling security is usually not very good. So, uh, way to go, Medical Commission in New York. We know that if we don't want to have uh, have wounds closed, we'll beat you up and you guys will just walk away. <laughs> oh, New York, you should be so proud of yourselves. <laughs> so, Jay gets another table from under the Technicolor streamers, sets it up outside. Jay drags Cole to the corner. He tries to superplex him from the top rope to the floor, again, a la 2K14. Cole then hits a super kick, and Jay goes crashing from the top rope through the table. Cole hits a couple of belt shots. There's another super kick to Cole to the back of the head, tries to hit the floor to key suplex for a two. Cole then jumps off the second rope. Jay catches him in a fireman's carry position. Death and Valley Driver to the table. Death Valley Driver sim right through the conveniently propped up table in the opposite Which had been corner. there pretty much, like, I think Cole got that out right, pretty quick into the match. So it had been there most of the match. Yeah, that table was pretty much ignored for for about 10, 10 straight minutes. Jay hey, did, it's a table spot. <laughs> hey, we haven't used this gimmick. <laughs> so Jay, Jay goes under the ring and he grabs a bag. And I don't know if you've ever seen the PWG clip of Joey Ryan taking the bump into a bag of Lego bricks. <laughs> I was praying this was a bag of Legos because this particular crowd would have popped huge for that. But it was uh, a bunch of multicolored thumbtacks to go along with the multicolored streamers. Hey, Abyss must be in the building somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but, no, Abyss always used just plain gray tacks. These, they, they weren't as colorful and festive. Maybe because it's Christmas season, they, they're trying to bring some color to this thumbtack deathmatch. And I thought once he dumped, dumped them out, that we were going to get a J-driller through them. Well, we preceded that by having Cole. Now, this was the sickest thing I think I've ever seen, fake or not. Cole shoves a handful of the tacks into Jay's mouth and super kicks the piss out of him. And Jay sells this by doing the greatest Shawn Michaels spit take I've ever seen, <laughs> spitting out a bunch of thumbtacks into the, into the ether. These thumbtacks are not edible. <laughs> Do not try to digest these. <laughs> they might be very painful. <laughs> uh, so then the, uh, I guess the ending comes where, uh, 
It's at this point where Cole has tried multiple belt shots for two counts. Jay is standing over him, looking like a stern father about to whip his boy the way that Delaware residents would normally do, I'm assuming. <laughs> the way I'm sure they, I'm sure the Briscoes grew up that way. And there's the slow build of Cole's just slowly looking up at him, and Jay's looking down, very evil-like. Uh, there's a third Jay Driller under the title belt for the win, at which point both guys just collapse and are lying dead in a heap. Streamers. Jay Briscoe has done it. He streamers, has retained his title in a very anticlimactic fashion. Streamers and thumbtacks asunder. That ends ROH's final battle 2014. This was a good show. Very good show. I thought it was too. I thought it, it almost seemed like that the main event was anticlimactic after seeing two really good tag matches. Right. But, uh, this, of course, this wasn't the sort of match that you would put on in the middle of a card. They gotta push their title. Um, well, that's something you know. ROH is good at too, is always kind of have, unless they have a bigger match in the main event and having their title match on last and having it being a big built thing. And this has been building for over a year, pretty much. So does this, uh, does this close off the Adam Cole Jay Briscoe feud or do we get one more match? I think it ends it, but where does that leave? This is where I was hoping someone would come in, because now where does that leave Jay Briscoe for a contender? Does he go backwards and beat up Michael Bennett and Matt Taven for the next six months? I would say, you, you, first of all, you need to keep both guys off TV for at least you know a couple of months, depending on how they've booked their taping schedules. I, I think, well, their next taping is January 4th, 3rd. Okay. So I think they, they've at least got like a month and a half. They've got two months between now and the anniversary show. So maybe you don't, maybe you have Cole take some time off. I think they'd have Briscoe on there anyway, but they usually don't do the world title match on TV too often. And I know the, the next I, tapings are the uh, top prospect tournament that they do every year. So the other thing I can see is perhaps going back to, uh, him and Elgin. And, and that's why I was it. hoping to actually come out after his one in Elgin and just beat up Jay Briscoe. That way you the, have that set up for the anniversary or whenever they want to do it. I would have him come out, but perhaps don't lay a hand on him. Just do a stare down to close the show. I never got my rematch because <laughs> I was a baby and walked out. Yes, and then I couldn't get out of my own country because I don't know how to file paperwork. Yeah, I'm Canadian. Do us proud, Elgin. Yeah, those dumb Canadians. <laughs> So, speaking of Canadians, going back to the uh, the R.D. Evans match, I thought that that sharpshooter, he looked looked really cool. I thought technically that looked probably better than most guys have able to hook that move. So, uh, Especially with R.D. doing it on someone who outweighs him by about 100 pounds. Right, with those giant legs. So, uh, R.D. Evans, I know you're listening to this. Hats off to you, my my uh, good brother. And uh, we'll talk you know, to you the soon. The other thing with the R.D. Evans moose thing is that Obviously, Evans is probably done, but where do they go now with Moose and all that? They probably won't mention Nana's involvement, and I'm kind of interested in how long they had this all planned out, actually. It's too bad that Moose wasn't a babyface, because though he'd kind of make a good uh, contender for for Jay Lethal. Yeah, maybe. Oh, well, I mean, they still cheer for him. You know, they cheer from the way that they cheer for, you know, a good heel. So, overall, uh, I would say if you didn't see this show... Go out of your way to see the six man. To go to see the uh, tag titles. The tag title match. Those were both uh, tremendous matches. Uh, I thought the Jay Lethal Matt Seidel match was 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 pretty good. Uh, the strong page match is something you should probably go out of your way to see too. Yeah. So uh, so not not really a bad mat bad match on this on this show. And I'm I'm looking forward to the. If you take away Moose and Artie Evans, yeah. You know, even that. You know, you gotta have some filler. You gotta have some filler in there. And this is actually better paced than Best in the World was, which I saw back in June. So. So, uh, like I said, I look forward to the anniversary show. I'm, I'll probably go to the pocket for that one as well. I'll still steal from, uh, from Vince and Dana, but I'm gonna do, uh, <laughs> but I'll actually pay yes. for, uh, for ROH. Yep. Mike, it was a pleasure working with you for the first time. I'm sure that we'll get to do it again. Hopefully we can do it again in March for yep. ROH's 13th anniversary show. Yep. And we'll see you guys then. Bye. Bye. 